me. See, I'm helping you find my analysis. I thought she wanted to go up there and sit next to me, but yeah, she doesn't want to. Um, one thing I do want to add, um, I did get, do my graduate work at Lincoln University, but my undergr I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I got my undergraduate degree from Morgan State University. So I also want to add that. Um, before I go on, I'd like to have permission from the elders to continue. Go ahead, speak. Yeah, I'm Um So when I saw the call for papers, um, I'd already been thinking a lot about Black Lives Matter in general, just as a concept and as a movement, and a lot of the, um, I guess a lot of things you, you know, I've seen on social networks and just a lot of the conversations that I've been hearing, and I just had, have had a lot of thoughts about it. And um, in 2015, I originally wrote an essay about it just with some of my thoughts. And then I saw this um, as an opportunity to follow up to that essay because I've had more thoughts since 2015 about it. Um, but last week I was actually here in the same place at the African Heritage Studies Association conference, and you know I kind of wanted to modify the presentation because I think initially I saw it as an opportunity to just uh, practice a form of um, black on black violence uh, that I think sometimes we get caught up in. Um, I actually learned this from uh, Dr. Carr. It's kind of this idea of um, you know, some different, you know, we don't always agree. A lot of times we have different ideologies and different beliefs on, you know, how, you know, what paths we should take to get to, get to freedom, to get to our liberation. Um, and we really just use it as a time, to, as, as a way to, you know, attack other black people. So it's like the internalized anti-blackness kind of just works through it. So even if you, like, become conscious or, like, become, you know, and I've been guilty of this myself, I have to admit. Um, you become, like, a so-called, like, revolutionary, you know, say, well, y'all aren't as revolutionary as me, so, you know, I'm going to attack you. So those things happen. Um, but I was thinking about a, uh, a quote from 1968 with, uh, from Kwame Ture. Um, it's in Stokely Speaks. Um, it's dealing with his, uh, the free Huey rally, uh, Huey P. Newton birthday um, celebration in Oakland. And I'm going to start off with the quote. And throughout, throughout this presentation, I'm going to raise some quotes and then talk, let's talk about how you know, my analysis is affected by, by these quotes, or how my analysis ties into, rather, these quotes. So, he says, he starts off, he says, uh, every Negro is a potential black man. We will not alienate him. And we must understand the concept of Negro and the concept of black man. We came to this country as black men and as Africans. It took us 400 years to become Negroes. Understand that. It means that the concept of a black man is one who recognizes his cultural and historical roots. He recognizes that his African ancestors were the greatest warriors on the face of this earth. Many of our people's minds have been whitewashed. If a Negro comes up to you and you turn your back on him, he's got to run to the home. We're going to take time and patience with our people because they're ours. All of the Uncle Toms are ours. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk, and when they slap, we're going to bow. We're going to try to bring them home. And if they don't come home, we're going to offer them. That's all. We, 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 have to, we, we have to recognize who our major enemy is. The major enemy is not your brother, flesh of your flesh and blood of your blood. The major enemy is the honky and his institutions of racism. That is the major enemy. And whenever anybody prepares for revolutionary warfare, you concentrate on the major enemy. We're not strong enough to fight each other and also fight him. We will not fight today, fight each other today. There will be no fights in the black community among black people. There will just be people that will be off. There will be no fights, there will be no disruptions. We're going to be united. Um, so this also made me think of this other um, comment by Dr. Bobby Wright, who was mentioned earlier, um, who actually I was able to, for, able to present on last week at, at AHSA. Um, one of the things he said is like, we, we, we should have these conversations, we should challenge ideas, and we should inter interrogate um, these different ideas that people bring to the table, but there's a difference between, as he said, critical scrutiny and attack. So we definitely need a lot of critical scrutiny. I mean, that's the, that's the essence of what think tanks are for. And you know, we sit down, we come together, we say, well, I think this, you think that, we think, you think this. And we all come together, we say, okay, well, what works? And we should be open to this and not allow our egos to stand in the way because ultimately we're trying to win. Like we're trying to get liberated. So, you know, if somebody hasn't considered something that someone else has, then so be it. You know, we bring it to the table. Um, so, beginning, I kind of, you know, I just have some questions and some, some issues that I've had with uh, Black Lives Matter. And that's why I have the title of this paper, which may sound kind of provocative. It may even hurt some people's feelings. It may be offensive. But again, remember, this is about critical scrutiny. It's not about attack. It's not about, um, as a lot of people in my generation would call hate. It's not about hating Black Lives Matter. But it's about critical scrutiny. Um, so things that came to mind, and, and, and uh, again, it needs, to be, it needs to be addressed because Black Lives Matter as a movement has captured the imagination of a lot of our people. So anything that has captured the imagination of a lot of our people, we need to, we need to deal with it. We need to deal with it. Um, I found this book. I teach at uh, Overbrook High School in West Philly. And um, I found this book in the library. So I kind of I liberated the book. Um, so it kind of, it's, 
it sits on my desk in my classroom because the school, unfortunately, we don't really use it as a place for students to come and engage and you know deal with the books. And so I say, well, I'm gonna take it. I know students coming to my class. I teach five different classes, so they're in there, so they can see this on my desk at least, and we can have some conversations about it. But as I started reading, this is a book called Mr. Black Labor: The Story of A. Philip Randolph, Father of the Civil Rights Movement. I started reading. I was reading the introduction. Um, the introduction was actually written by Bayard Rustin. I think Bayard Rustin did a lot of um, did a lot of positive work for the community for the civil rights movement, but there's some things that he said, some things he stands for that I don't necessarily agree with. So I do want to mention two quotes um, from that introduction that kind of remind me or made me think of the a lot of the way Black Lives Matter is marketed to us at least, even if that's not their goal, but this is the way it seems to be marketed. One of his quotes is that and he's, he's talking about uh, Asa Philip Randolph. The close relationship between the civil rights and labor movements might have never come about had Mr. Randolph taken the easy road of separatism. I don't know how separatism is easy. But, um, <laughs> however, he always realized that separatism, whether espoused by Marcus Garvey or latter-day nationalists, is grounded in fantasy and myth, despite its emotional appeal to an oppressed people. Um, and I, you know, I was, as I was thinking, I was like, this dovetails, this dovetails nicely with the language in the her story of Black Lives Matter. Because it's interesting, I originally wrote the essay about some of my ideas about Black Lives Matter back in 2015. I hadn't even went to the website. I hadn't even went to blacklivesmatter.com. I hadn't really done my research. Um, that's why I realized I had to write some more things. I had some more ideas once I, once I read it. Um, there's a quote from the history of Black Lives Matter, which can be found again on the website. It goes, it goes beyond the narrow nationalism that can be prevalent within some black communities, which merely call on black people to love black, live black and buy black, keeping straight CIS men in the front of the movement while our sisters, queer and trans and disabled folk take up roles in the background or not at all. Now I'm not going to engage and get into all the sexual politics or the gender politics of that, but I'm really focused more on the, the nationalism, the, the critique of narrow nationalism. Um, I don't know um, any other type of nationalism besides a narrow nationalism. I don't know what a broad nationalism is. I don't know what that, what that, I don't know what that looks like. Um, I just I don't know. It's like a, you know, um, multicultural nationalism. I, I don't I don't know. Um, and but then the question is, I mean, like you know, if we go back to reference Malcolm X and his battle of the bullet speech, what he said was, and what a lot of people echo was that it's only nationalism that enabled any powerful groups or groups to gain independence and to gain power and, and maintain power. It's it's nationalism that does this. Um, so my question is then, you know, what methods will they utilize to achieve power? You know, land and resources, which I think really should be our main focus. Or is that even the goal, right? And also, I, you know, I've heard the term narrow nationalism before, but, you know, I've seen it as a derogatory term used by communists, um, the same type of communists that expelled George Padmore from the Communist Party. Because he was very clear that I'm an African first. Mm -hmm. And when the Communist Party comes to him and says, you have to stop critiquing Great Britain, and because we basically were friends, we're going to be friends with Great Britain now. He says, no, Great Britain has colonies in Africa, and I'm an African. So then we need to part our ways right now. Um, and that's nationalism. I think that's the type of nationalism that we as black people need globally. Um, and also, I just wonder also, you know, why, why discredit loving black, living black, and buying black? Like, why discredit that? And have that on your website. I just, I wonder about that. Um, so that, there was one quote by, uh, by Bayard Russell. Another part, uh, another, another thing that I pulled from that introduction was when Bayard Russell says, quote, despite virulent criticism and unyielding opposition, he, referring to A. Philip Randolph, never lost sight of the realistic. Black people, he realized, could never advance without the good feelings and assistance of many whites. Ouch. 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 So, when I read that, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you start underlining, you start writing all in the margin and everything. <laughs> like I said, I liberated the book, so, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, do, do the whites assist, assist us or they control us in a lot of these, these, these situations, these organizations? Um, also, who funds Black Lives Matter? Mm -hmm. You know, where's the money from? Who's cutting the checks? Right? Exactly. So it's George Soros and other rich neoliberals. Uh -huh. uh, I think that needs to be part of the conversation. That's not something we can just say, well, you know, sweep that under the rug. Like, who's paying for it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can, you know, another thing that Kwame Ture said is that, you know, insecure economic groups cannot form coalitions with secure economic groups. Or be that, that, that are secure economically. All right, so that, that's, that's just, just to start off. And, and again, um, another thing I, I consider about Black Lives Matter is I, I'm a mathematics teacher. So I've been teaching mathematics for 12 years. And one of the courses I've taught is geometry. Some of us, you know, we took geometry before. Um, 10th grade, you think back. Um, I started thinking about geometric proofs. Thinking about how um, you have postulates, you have theories, and you use deductive reasoning to arrive at a conclusion. 
or to prove something. So Black Lives Matter, again, as it's marketed, says to me that we're trying to prove that Black Lives Matter. Exactly. When in fact, that's given information. Right. That's a postulate. Right. That's something you start with. Right. 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 So we, so we start out with that. Okay. We're not trying to prove that. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially we're not trying to prove that to white people. Right. Because one of the things I say is, you know, I, like what, like you know, and we, we can de-intellectualize this. Like, what do I look like trying to prove that my life matters to somebody that already decided that my life don't matter? Exactly. <laughs> that's meant to side. Again, Bobby Wright. Right. That's meant to side. Um, so, like, you know, looking at it, you know, from a mathematical standpoint. It's like, you know, in, in terms of logic, like, you know, we, we, we already know that our life matters. Now, what we can try to prove or try to at least figure out is how are we going to achieve and acquire power, land, and resources. You know, that's, and, what, and what's the most effective way and means by which we can do that. Um, and also, I think that the problem with, one other problem with Black Lives Matter and the, the language is that it, it still centers white people because we're trying to prove to whites that our life matters. Um, and we don't need to prove our humanity to anyone, except for ourselves. I mean, there may be members, or well, there are members of our community that are miseducated, that don't believe in the value of our lives. That's who we should be having that conversation with. Like, we don't need to have the conversation with other people. All right? Um, let me see. Right. And again, um, Black Lives Matter, I've seen it to serve as a response to police terrorism, mass incarceration, et cetera. Um, but somebody also uh, echoed this, this issue of power. And, you know, again, Kwame Ture, going back to him, he has many quotables um, that apply here. He says, one of the things he said is that if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. But if a white man has the power to lynch me, then that's my problem. Right? right. right? So again, it's an issue of power. It's an issue, issue, issue of power. Um, does the, the, so my question, another question I have is, does the Black Lives Matter movement have a concentrated focus on addressing the power discrepancies in our community? by seizing power for our people, which would be revolutionary? Or is the goal only reform where the group just works to influence those in power to treat them differently while still allowing them to maintain that power? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's, that's the question. Um, and since I'm invoking ancestors, yes. okay. um, since I'm invoking ancestors, another ancestor I want to invoke is uh, 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 the late uh, Baba Asa Hillier. Um, I was, I, I let, again, I live in Philadelphia, and um, Professor uh, Eddie Lloyd, he gave a presentation at LaSalle University um, a couple weeks ago, and he's, um, he's basically like he's promoting his new book, um, Democracy in Black, and one of the things he said that jumped out at me was he used, he used the term value gap. He was describing Black Lives Matter and kind of, and the audience was mostly, you know, mostly white people, right? Um, so he's, you know, he's, you know, talking about, I guess, you know, how, you know, bad white people have been behaving and everything. And I guess I think that's what the book is basically about, um, and why there's a need for Black Lives Matter. And he used the term value gap. So when he used the term value gap, I think about um, this is a young gift for the black uh, book with three essays in it. Uh, I believe the best one is, is by Asa Hilliard at the end, um, where he's talking about the achievement gap. And as an educator, that's one of those terms that is thrown around very, very much. And he, um, you know, I believe that, you know, in this work, um, Asa Hilliard essentially debunks the concept of an achievement gap. Um, the title of the essay is No Mystery, Closing the Achievement Gap Between Africans and Excellence. All right? So I immediately think he says value gap, and then something just went off in my head. I said, okay, well, you know, I think Asa Hilliard already dealt with this in a different context, but we can apply that, that same analysis that Baba Asa Hilliard, another African Center scholar and founding member of ASCAP, already utilized. And we can just, we can, we can apply it here. Um, and, you know, I dis I dis so I disagree with Professor Galloy and his, you know, use of this, this idea of the value gap because, I th again, I think that it still centers white people. It centers white people. Um, so, I, I, again, I, will, uh, I have some quotes from the essay and then some analysis following those quotes. So one quote is this um, from uh, Baba Asa Hillier. Note that when speaking of the achievement gap, it is understood by virtually everyone that this, is, this does not refer to a gap between Africans and Asians or a gap between Africans and Latinos or a gap between Africans and anyone else other than Europeans. Therefore, right away, it seems that something more than achievement is being discussed when the gap language is used. Framing the language in this way is itself problematic. Importantly, it establishes European average achievement as the universal norm. No matter what the quality of achievement may be, even if it is mediocre. 
Certainly, dialogue about the gap is seldom followed up by a detailed analysis of the achievements of the norm group. Closer scrutiny is usually heaped on those who perform poorly than on those who succeed. Re-examining the norm group's achievement would reveal that the typical discussion about the norm really may be a discussion about normative mediocrity. So when Black Lives Matter compares the value of black life to white life with the assumption that it almost has an assumption that white life is superior. Right. So it's like, you know, it's like, like white, white life is superior, we need to get up to their level. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't, you know, because there, there, there's a lot of mediocrity in the white community. <laughs> a lot. Historically, currently, like we know this. When, when we do our study, we, we see this. Um, so it's like the same thing, like, you know, with, uh, you know, comparing like white students, like black students in certain schools to white students in other schools. Like, all white children are smart. All white children aren't um, scoring through the roof on standardized tests. But it's just, uh, this, this achievement gap. And what it does is it, it, it gets us caught up. We're always trying to chase white people. Right. We're trying to catch up to them and do, do what they're doing. Um, another quote. Um, okay, excellence should be judged based upon criterion levels of performance, not relative levels. This gets us away from the black-white achievement gap. The gap between the present level of performance for African students and the criterion performance standards that should be required is the academic gap that must be closed. Again, the criterion performance standards that should be required is the academic gap that must be closed. Too often, by using European students' normative performance as the universal standard, not only do we use a low standard, but we tend to be satisfied with the performance of minority cultural groups when a substantial reduction in this gap occurs, the unconscious assumption seems to be that the traditional low performers cannot surpass, they can merely approach the performance of the norm group. Right? Our criteria, end quote, our criterion performance level can be the standards politically, socially, and economically that our ancestors set, for, set forth for us thousands of years ago, and even more recently than that. We don't, we don't need to make relative comparisons to Europeans. And perhaps speaking of Bobby Wright again, perhaps one of the things he advocated for was a comprehensive black social theory. So perhaps within that comprehensive black social theory, um, we can, that's where those criterion uh, performance standards, criterion levels of performance standards can be set and can be found. Right? So we'll know, okay, like, you know, as a, as a black child, this is where you should be. Like, you know, and, and this is the standard because this is the standard that we as a collective have determined it should be. Not because, you know, Mary and Jane or whatever out in the suburbs at the white school is what they're doing, so we got to do what they're doing. No. Uh, another quote. There can be no question but that the achievement of African students is, in general, far below their potential. This gap, however, should not be thought of as the gap between black and white students. It should be thought of as the gap between the current performance of African students and levels of excellence. When we choose excellent performance as the goal, academically and socially, we change the teaching and learning paradigm in fundamental ways. By setting the required performance level of excellence, we require excellent performance to be articulated. End quote. We only need to consider the gap between our children and our ancestors. This reminds us of the need to build educational institutions that can be heavily invested in actually closing this gap. Right? Not the black-white gap, but the gap between our children today and our, our ancestors. In European-centered schools, this gap will never be closed because it does not benefit Europeans to close this gap. Such is the case with Black Lives Matter. It does not lead us to making these comparisons with our ancestors. Another quote. To me, the gap between Africans and Europeans is a non-issue. The real gap is between Africans' typical performance and the criterion levels of excellence which are well within the reach of the masses of them. That is the gap that is unacceptable, given what we know about what good teaching can do and what we know about the genius of children. I say that the gap between, I say the gap between black life and white life should also be a non-issue. And this is the last, the last quote on, just the last quote. Yeah, based upon that, I said, I think the last quote I have is, nonetheless convoluted, nonetheless convoluted explanations for differential achievement abound, recently cast in terms of neuroscience and psychology, having to do with the number of intelligences in the brain, or whether it's the left side or the right side that is working, or whether there is enough hard disk space in the student's brain, or whether there is a fast enough processor, all take the focus of professional attention away from quality control of services provided and all tend to ignore the matter of opportunity to learn. A review of research from the past century will reveal that the overwhelming body of inquiry has been focused on child deficiencies. Only a minuscule number of references have focused on savage, savage inequalities in service. And with that, he referenced the book by Jonathan Kozol, the 
17 qualities.